You're listening to Conferences Online Allergy from Children's Mercy Hospital in Kansas City, Missouri. Today is April 6, 2020, and I'm your host, Dr. Jay Portnoy. Our topic today, ABAS Chapter 11, Differentiation and Function of CD8 Positive Effector Cells. Our presenter is Dr. Nikita Raji. She's the Chief of the Section of Immunology at Children's Mercy Hospital in Kansas City, Missouri. I'm going to be talking about Chapter 11 from Abbas today. That's on differentiation and functions of CD8 effector T cells. So we talked about CD4 cells last time, and now we are going to talk about CD8 cells. So I don't have any disclosures. And here are our learning objectives um, to expand the understanding of differentiation of CD8 T cells into cytotoxic T lymphocytes or CTLs. Um, effector functions of CD8 CTLs and roles of CD8 positive CTLs in host defense. All right, so here are a couple of questions. Which pair of molecules are found in CTL granules and are important for CTL killing of target cells? We'll go over the options once we are done with the chapter. Another question, which of the following is a property of exhausted CD8 positive T cells. Naive viral antigen specific CD8 T cells require activation by viral peptide bound to the C molecules presented by dendritic cells, but dendritic cells may not be infected for many types of viruses. Which of the following mechanism accounts for CD8 positive T cell protection against viruses that do not infect dendritic cells? All right, so let's talk about differentiation and functions of CD8 effector T lymphocytes. So one major function is to help with defense against viruses. So viruses survive in variety of different cells and they cannot be killed unless that per particular cell that they infect has microbicidal mechanisms. The viruses cannot be killed in the cytosol where no access to killing mechanisms is present. Alternative is for the CTLs to kill the cell that's infected with the viruses. CD8 T cells can also help with defense against intracellular microbes. They help with, uh, with defense against cells that are damaged, such as tumor cells, and they play a role in acute rejection of all allografts. So let's talk about differentiation of CD8 T cells into cytotoxic T lymphocytes. So as we have talked in the past for CD4 cells, these lymphocytes, T lymphocytes, need APCs or antigen presenting cells to present the antigen to them. So here is our APC or antigen presenting cell that enters a secondary lymphoid organ like a lymph node with the antigen that it's going to present to the T cells, naive T cells in, this, in the lymph node. So once that interaction occurs between the APC and naive CD8 T cell, there, there are second signals that are needed. So there needs to be co-stimulation along with the uh, recognition of antigens. If both of those signals are present, then the naive T cell gets activated. Once activated, it's going to differentiate into, pro sorry, proliferate and then differentiate into uh, effector T cell. Once those effector T cells are, uh, can ex uh, are formed, they exit the lymph node, go get into the circulation, and then migrate to the site of infection where they can um, interact with the cells that are damaged or infected with intracellular organisms such as viruses. And then the killing of that uh, cell occurs. So that's the overall overall role of the CD8 cells. So when we talk about the CD8 cells, once the presentation of that antigen is occurs by the antigen presenting cells such as dendritic cells, 
they also need help from CD4 cells or the helper cell T cells. So helper T cells also help the process of activation or differentiation of CD8 cells. That helps them, the CD8 cells, to acquire the machinery that is important for killing. So they, those are called granules, uh, and those, are, those granules are basically modified lysosomes. These cells can also secrete cytokines, and su such as interferon gamma, and then interferon gamma will further help uh, provide help by activating phagocytes uh, to help with killing of the microbes that are present. Once that activation proliferation occurs and differentiation of CD8 into effector T cells or CTLs occurs, there is transcription of genes and that encode for effector molecules. So what are the effector molecules? Some of these granules or cytokines. And so that transcription is helped by some transcription factors they are TBET and uh, eomesodermin. So remember, we talked about transcription factors for various subsets of CD4 cells last week. So these are the transcription factors that are important for differentiation of CD8 cells into CTLs. All right, moving along and talking about the process of uh, activation further. So there is a role that APCs play in activation of CD8 cells. So think about the presentation of the antigen to these CD8 cells. It occurs when protein antigens are presented by MHC molecule on the surface of the antigen presenting cells. In case of CD8 cells, that's class 1 MHC. So if you think about it, class 1 MHC presents the intracellular organisms, so the protein antigens that are present in the cytosol of the cells, um, cytosol of the tissue cells, right? So say it's a liver cell that's infected with a virus, that liver cell is going to present that protein antigen that's from, so, so for example, from the viral protein that's present in the cytosol of liver cell is going to be presented on its surface using class 1. MHC. Sometimes there is something called cross presentation. So there are specialized dendritic cells that present antigens that are that are uh, detected by it from interaction with other cells that are around it. So say in the liver, there is a the liver is infected with a virus. That virus antigen once it presents to, it can present to the T cells or that viral antigen can be picked up by antigen presenting cell or dendritic cell when it is infecting other cells. So when that is picked up by the dendritic cells, typically it's an extra cellular uh, organism. So if it's, so for example, we talked about this, when CD4 cells are presented with an antigen, it uses class two MHC on the surface of dendritic cells. So if dendritic cells were to get into, uh, get an antigen from outside of the cell, it's gonna present that antigen on its surface using class two MHC. So if the dendritic cell does that, it will actually activate CD4 cells instead of CD8 cells. So how would it activate CD8 cells? So for that, there are specialized dendritic cells. In these cells, the 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 cell helps to transfer the antigens into the cytosol and because it's now present in cytosol instead of being presented on class 2 mhc it will present that to class 1 mhc this is called cross presentation plasma cytoid dendritic cells also transfer viral proteins to the cytosol so they can help with the cross presentation all right, so that was the role of APCs. They use cross presentation to, to present the antigen from the cytosol to the class, uh, on the class one MHC so that they can activate CD8 cells. How do CD4 cells help with the activation of CD8 cells? If there is a strong innate response in presence of an infection, there is no need for CD4 help. CD8 cells will be 
activated by themselves and the CD4 help is not needed. In case of latent infections, transplant, tumors, there is weak innate response. And in those cases, CD4 help is required to activate CD8 cells. So how do CD4 cells help? Typically, CD4 subsets are going to help by making sure that they release cytokines and they provide the second signal. So apart from cytokines, there is a second signal using CD40 ligand and CD40 that activates APCs to stimulate differenti differentiation of CD8 cells. So this process is called licensing. What it does is CD4 helps to activate the APCs and in turn APCs stimulate and activate the CD8 cells to differentiate into CTLs. So this is called licensing. So this figure basically just goes through that process. CD4 helper T cells produce cytokines. So APC interacts with a CD8 cell and interacts with the CD4 cells. CD4 cell is in because of that activation will release cytokines that will interact with CD8 cells. In turn, CD8 cells will differentiate into CTLs or memory CD8 cells. On the other hand, CD4 helper T cells enhance the ability of APCs to stimulate the C CTL differentiation. In this case, APC interacts with CD4. CD4, once that happens, the CD4 interacts with APC to with the co-stimulation so that the APC is gonna in, uh, is licensed to help the CD8 cells. So this licensed APC will release cytokines, use its co-stimulators to activate CD8 cell, and then it's going to differentiate into a CTL or uh, memory CD8 cell. What is the role of cytokines in this process? So there are several cytokines that help CD8 cell uh, differentiation and proliferation. So IL-2 cell, uh, sorry, IL-2 cytokine helps with differentiation of CD8 into CTLs or memory cells. Along with uh, type 1 interferons or Th1 cytokines, IL-12 helps CD8, uh, CD8 cells to differentiate into CTLs. IL-15 is important for survival of memory CD8 cells. And then IL-21 induces CD8 T cell memory and prevents CD8 T cell exhaustion. So let, let's talk about a T cell exhaustion. This means that there is inhibition of CD8 T cell response. So when, when do you call it tolerance versus exhaustion? So let's start with a naive CD8 T cell. Because of a viral infection, the, this naive T cell is going to be activated and it's going to proliferate to and differentiate into CD8 positive CTLs or effector CD8 cells. If this is an acute infection, the, these differentiated effector CD8 cells or CTLs will fight that infection and clear that antigen. It will also form memory of those cells. So because of that, this CTL is going to go ahead and interact with the cell that's infected with that particular virus and kill that cell. And then the memory CD8 T cells will survive to keep the memory and help with improved, um, improved defense in case of repeat infection. In case of a chronic infection, the antigen is going to persist because of the continuous uh, activation of the T cells, the CD8 T cell is going to be exhausted. So over a period of time, once it has interacted with several cells that are infected with that virus, they are going to start presenting an inhibitory receptor on their surface, such as PD-1. That PD-1 is going to interact with the infected cell that's going to present the, the ligand for PD-1. So PD-1 ligand is on target cell and PD-1 is on the CTLs. That interaction will, uh, will cause uh, the CD8 exhausted T cell to not 
have uh, the response that you see in the active infection. So because of that, uh, there is, <coughs> sorry, excuse me, <coughs> the CD8 T cells are unable to respond to the virus infected cell, so that virus infected cell continues to live and cause what we call as chronic infection. So that's T cell exhaustion. Let's talk about the effector functions of the CTLs. So now this CD8 cell has been activated. So the knife CD8 cell got activated, it proliferated, and then it got differentiated into the effector CD8 cell. The effector CD8 cell is called the CTL. That CD CTL is gonna interact with the target cell. And that interaction again includes uh, the immunological synapse. So it has the, uh, on the periphery, it has the adhesion molecules. It has the interaction between the TCR on CD8 with the MHC and antigen presented by the uh, target cell. And there is that core receptor CD8 that interacts with the uh, MHC as well. Once that happens, the CTL has the means of using the granules to cause granule exocytosis. Once that interaction occurs, the CTL will be detached and then the cell will be, uh, will be killed. So because of the way the granules are exocytosed, onto the target cell in the immunological synapse, the CTLs or adjacent cells without the antigen are not injured. CTLs do not need cytokines or co-stimulation after, they after their final differentiation, which is another good thing, so that they, they can actually do the killing uh, pretty efficiently without the need of uh, co-stimulation from target cell. All right, so there are these other NK cell receptors. So CD8 T cells have specific cells. And now remember, similar granules can be present in NK cells, and though there are some receptors on NK cells that help with similar interaction. Here, this figure shows um, the interaction of uh, CTLs with the target cell. So the target cell is in the center. There are CTLs around it. They are interacting with that area that's called the immunological synapse. And with during that time, there is exocytosis of the granules inside the target cell. <clears throat> so let's talk further about that interaction and uh, use of granules. So this, the CTLs, CTL mediated killing of target cells is made possible by the granules. So let's start with the interaction of the CTL with the target cell. So within minutes of that interaction, if there was uh, an antigen that was recognized, within minutes, granule proteins are delivered into the uh, target cell. And that death occurs within two to six hours. So what are these what are the granules um, composed of? Cytotoxic proteins are stored in secretory lysosomes. These are granzyme A, granzyme B, granzyme C, perforin, serglycin, and cathepsin B. Another one is granulysin. So the granzymes are the most important ones. They are required for the CTL cytotoxicity. What they do is they activate caspases, which are important for apoptosis of the target cell. Perforin, as the name suggests, makes a perforation in the target cell. So this is the means by which the other uh, granules can be released into the cytotoxic, uh, sorry, into the target cell. So the perforin is similar to what we had talked about for complement um, proteins. So Remember, there is a molecule called C9 or complement 9. That complement 9 is the one that makes the final pore in the target cell. Similarly, perforin is the one that will make the pore in the target cell so that the other ends, sorry, other um, granules are released into that cell. Serglycin. 
it helps the assembly of a complex with granzymes and perforin. So it kind of is a base which helps to bring the granzymes and perforin together. Cathepsin B, it protects the CTL from perforin. Otherwise, what would happen is the CTL itself will be damaged. And then granulysin, it alters the permeability of target cells. That's what it's believed. And so that's what we call the granule dependent killing. So let's look at the figure again. Here is a CD8 CTL that interacts with the target cell. Because of that recognition, the CD8 T cell is going to use its, uh, uh, its granules where Perforin is going to make a perforation in the target cell, and then the granzymes are released inside the cell. Once they are released inside the cell, there is uh, these granzymes are going to activate the caspases, and those caspases are going to lead to apoptosis of the target cell. There is also something called granule independent killing, which is fast and fast ligand mediated where there is interaction with the target cell for CD8 CTL. And because of uh, the fast ligand on the CTL that's, uh, that's um, expressed, it can interact with FAS that's present, present on the target cell. Because of the fast ligand and FAS interaction, there is apoptosis of the target cell. So how does that overall interaction occurs where the granules know exactly where to be in the CTL so that they can interact with this with the target cell? So inside the CTL, there is a cytoskeleton that is reorganized so that from where the granules are made in the cell, they can be brought to the surface and be released on the target cell. So the initiation of this process begins when the CTL and the antigen on the target cell interact. Once that happens, the microtubule organizing center of the CTL moves in the cytoplasm near the target cell contact site. The cytoplasmic granules are transported along the microtubules and concentrated in the synapse. Once that happens, the granule membrane fuses with the plasma membrane and exocytosis is confined in is occurs in the confined space within the synaptic ring. So before we go move on from this slide, I wanted to let you know that this is the most important part to understand the pathogenesis of uh, familial uh, HLH. So in familial HLH, there is a defect either in the granule or in the microtubular structure that helps with the release of these granules into the target cell. So the movement of the granules might be defective because of which the target cell is not killed. There is continuous um, inflammation that can be seen with uh, HLH. So there are various genes that are defective that can cause a defect in a particular part of the microtubular structure um, that can lead to Chediakigashi syndrome, um, Griselli syndrome, hermansky pudlak syndrome, and then there are several others in that line where they affect the microtubular structure or movement of the granules along, along this, uh, this cytoskeleton. All right, cytokines that are produced by CD8 effector cells or CTLs. So the, one of them is the interferon gamma. In, it's important in contact dermatitis. So what happens is CD8 cells um, can secrete interferon gamma that's even more, uh, maybe even more than CD4 cells that plays a role in contact dermatitis. All right, so talking about the CTL's um, role in host defense. So we know that there are two types of infections that we that these CTLs uh, are important for viruses that live in the cells that lack phagosome or lysosome and microbes that 
escape the vesicles and live in the cytosol. If there is a defect in CTLs, there is increased susceptibility to viral infections, some bacterial infections, there can be reactivation of some vir latent viruses such as EBV and some in intracellular organisms such as mycobacteria, tuberculosis or malaria. If there is so in case of um, some viral infections, the virus itself might not be a threat to the uh, uh, to the human. It's more that there is, because of the presence of the virus, CTLs are affected, CTLs are activated, and because of that, they cause the, the injury. So for example, liver injury. So think about hepatitis virus. The hepatitis virus infects viral, uh, sorry, liver cell. And once it infects the uh, liver cell, the liver cell detects it and presents it to the uh, the CT, uh, sorry, the CD8 cells. The CD8 cells get activated, differentiate into CTLs, and this they start fighting the viral, the cells that are affected by hepatitis virus because of which the liver cells are killed. That killing of the liver cells by the CTLs cause injury and destruction of the structure of liver and cause the damage rather than the virus itself. CD8 T cells are important for tumor immunity and rejection of the organ transplants as well. And then I just talked about the HLH part where they play, the CTLs play an important role and if they are defective or the microtubular structure that's important for the granular exocytosis is defective, then it causes what we know as genetic cause of uh, HLH or it's also called familial HLH. All right, so this was a short chapter. So we can go ahead and talk about the questions uh, that we had in a, uh, at the start, beginning of the chapter. Which pair of molecules are found in CTL granules and are important for CTL killing of target cells? Anyone? Um, Perforin and granzyme B. That's correct. So the tricky part is yes, perforin and fast ligand are present, are expressed by CTLs, but we are talking just about the um, granule dependent killing here. Which of the following is a property of exhausted CD8 T cells? Um, C, high expression of PDL or PD1. PD1, right. So once they are exhausted, they increase the expression of PD1 that interacts with the PD1 ligand and the target cells uh, because of which the, there can be uh, chronic infection because the T cells cannot fight that uh, virus. Naive viral antigen specific, sorry, naive viral antigen specific CD8 T cells require activation by viral peptide bound to MHC molecules presented by dendritic cells. But dendritic cells may not be infected by many types of viruses. So which of the mechanisms uh, accounts for CD8 positive T cell protection against viruses that do not infect dendritic cells? Um, ingestion of viral proteins into the dendritic cell endosomes, and then they're transported into the cytosol where they're processed by proteasome and where they'll become part of the MHC1, so C. So that's correct. So initially, if it was a, if it was a infection of the dendritic cell, then that's a different story. But if it was an infection of virus by, it, sorry, infection of some other cells, then there has to be cross presentation. So there is transport of proteins into the cytosols so that they are processed by proteasomes and pumped into the ER where they can bind to newly formed class one MHC molecules. 